My name is Marcin Andrychowicz, and in the first part of this talk, I'm going to present a project I worked on when I was at OpenAI. It was a pretty huge effort, took more than two years, and at the end, there were almost 20 people working on it. Uh, the goal for the project I'm going to talk about was to perform dexterous in-hand manipulation on a humanoid five-fingered hand. Uh, it's an important problem because human hand is a universal end effector. Tasks which are not automatized are obviously done by humans. And despite the importance of the problem, quite little progress has been made on it because it's very hard to devise control policies for so complicated robots. As a concrete task, we chose solving Rubik's Cube, and the reason for that is simply that this is one of the hardest tasks which can be done with a single hand and no arm. Uh, the difficulty lies mostly in the high dimensionality of the system. For example, the robot we chose, Shadow Dexter's hand, has 24 joints and 20 actuators. And uh, it's hard because we, uh, we need to train control policies which are going to work well on real hardware. And this means they have to deal with noisy and delayed sensor readings and with partial observability. Uh, moreover, what was quite a surprise for me, it's virtually impossible to simulate in-hand manipulation due to a high number of simultaneous contacts between the object, the fingers, and the palm. Uh, here you can see our complete robotic setup. Shadow hand is mounted in the center, and it's surrounded by a 3D face-based tracking system. So this system is used to track the fingertips of the hand and can also be used to optionally track the object being manipulated. We also have three RGB cameras for vision-based operation. Uh, here is a close-up. Uh, the red markers in the fingertips, these are LED markers which are used by the tracking system. Uh, so our approach is composed of two core ideas, uh, reinforcement learning and automatic domain randomization. I'm going to talk about them one by one, so let's start with uh, RL and its applications to robotics. Uh, here you can see a, the standard RL framework, so we have an agent, which can be also called a control policy, and it symbolizes the robot, and the time proceeds in discrete time steps. At every time step, uh, the robot specifies some action, for example, the signals which are sent to the motors, and receives some observation, for example, object position, and a scalar reward signal. And the agent's task is to behave in a way which maximizes the sum of rewards. And this sum is usually called a return. Uh, reinforcement learning algorithms try to achieve this goal by trying different behaviors and reinforcing the ones which lead to higher returns. Uh, reinforcement learning has recently achieved really spectacular level of success in playing games. AlphaGo Zero defeated the best human players in the game of Go, and OpenAI 5 and AlphaStar mastered Dota and StarCraft. Uh, and in, in those cases, it's been achieved using just reinforcement learning and self-play. Uh, so it's, it's natural to ask if we can uh, apply very similar techniques to robotics to get intelligent robots which can learn new skills autonomously. The issue is that uh, reinforcement learning is unfortunately still very sample inefficient. For example, AlphaGo Zero, to reach its level, it has played 5 million games against itself. So that's roughly 500 years of playing uh, continuously. And similarly, OpenAI 5 was playing 180 years of games every day for a period of multiple months, and AlphaStar consumed 60,000 years of gameplay. And, uh, gathering this amount of experience on a physical robot uh, would be simply infeasible. One potential solution is to parallelize data gathering and uh, use a farm of robots. On the picture, you can see a robot farm from Google Brain. Uh, the disadvantage of this approach is that its uh, robot farms are expensive to build and costly to maintain, and it's also hard to iterate on new problems in this setup. An alternative is to train control policies in a physics simulator. Uh, this is, of course, much cheaper and more scalable. And nowadays, we have realistic rendering, and we have physics which also look realistic, but 
they're often based on different laws than uh, real-world physics, and as a result, they are not very accurate. Uh, in fact, physics simulators are often designed for the game industry, so it's more important that they look good than uh, they are really accurate. Uh, so this approach of training control policies in simulator and then just deploying it in the real world, it's called sim to real and that's the approach we took. Uh, here you can see our initial simulator. Uh, actually solving Rubik's Cube in simulator turned out to be uh, really easy. It took us about uh, a month to get to this stage. And uh, in simulation, the policy can solve, the, solve Rubik's Cube in about 15 seconds. So we thought that, oh, this is so easy, that we are almost done with the project. But the real challenge with sim to real is that simulation is really a very simplified model of, of reality. Uh, for example, the real robot is actuated with tendons, and these tendons stretch with time, their behavior changes from day to day, and in simulation there are no tendons. We assume that torques are directly applied to joints. And there are many discrepancies like that, and as a result, policies trained in simulator can perform very poorly on a physical robot. Uh, this was indeed a case here. Our initial policy was not even able to rotate a single face once on a robot, let alone solve Rubik's Cube. We tackle this challenge with a technique called domain randomization, which I'm going to describe next. Uh, one of the first examples of domain randomization was work of Sadehi and Levin in 2016. Uh, they trained a, a collision avoidance policy for a quadcopter, and they trained it in a simulator with lots of varied textures on walls and furniture, and then they, sh they just deployed it in the real world. And it turned out that it, it just works, despite not being trained on a single real image. Uh, we later used the same technique at OpenAI to train a vision network to predict object position and orientation, and what is surprising, it turns out that you can use even completely random textures, uh, examples of which you can see on the slide, and this convnet still transfers to real-world images. We knew that domain randomization works well for vision, so it was natural to ask if we can apply similar technique to the dynamics of the system to aid transfer of control policies. Uh, so we decided to try it first on a simpler task than in-hand manipulation, namely pushing an object on a table. So what we did is we took uh, physical parameters of the systems like masses, friction, damping coefficients, or table height, and we randomized most of them. So for example, uh, each mass is sampled from between 25% and four times of our estimate of each mass, and we sample these parameters once at the beginning of each episode, and then uh, train a policy on it. We also use a policy with memory so that it can learn something about the current environment and can adapt. Uh, here you can see the simulator. Uh, the task, as I said, is to push this object onto the target position, which is denoted by the red ball. And as you can see, the policy can, can do it in simulation. But as a baseline, let's see the same policy on, on a real robot. Uh, so first of all, it is very shaky. And the second problem is that it often overshoots the target. So this was trained without randomizations. And for comparison, this is a policy which was trained with randomizations. Uh, as you can see, it is much, much smoother, and it is usually able to perform the task. We wanted to check how, how robust this policy is, uh, so we attached a bag of tips to the bottom of the object. Uh, this makes it uh, much more slippery, but as you can see, uh, the policy can still solve the task. Uh, all the policies I've shown so far, uh, they, they, these are policies with memory, uh, namely LSTMs. Uh, to check if this memory is important, we have also trained a feedforward policy. Uh, and this, so this is a policy without memory. It was trained with randomizations. But despite that, again, it's shaky and it cannot really perform the task. Uh, so to sum up, the approach is to randomize the environment and to use a memory augmented policy. And in this setup, can, the policy can not only become robust to those different physical parameters, but it can also perform implicit system identification and adapt its behavior to the current physics. <laughs> 
Uh, as a milestone on the way to solve Rubik's Cube, we also considered a simpler task, namely a task of rigid box reorientation. So on the on the right side, you can see uh, the desired orientation of the object, and once it gets achieved, we randomly sample a new one. Uh, so this, this policy was trained uh, entirely in simulation with domain randomization. This is the first time it is experiencing real physics, but despite that, it is able to perform the task. Uh, we published this result a year ago, so I'm not go going to go uh, into much detail. Uh, but most of the techniques used here are the same as in our Rubik's Cube release. Uh, the main novel element in, in the Rubik's Cube release is that we automatized the process of domain randomization. Uh, because with standard domain randomization, you have to exactly specify the distribution of training environments. And this includes uh, uh, fully specifying the randomization ranges. So things like that masses are sampled from between 25% and four times of our estimate of each mass. And it's very time consuming to come up with those ranges because it's hard to guess what values lead to stable simulation and how they influence the difficulty of, the, of learning and the transfer performance. So in our solution, which we call automatic domain randomization, it's enough to specify the types of randomizations which are applied and the exact randomization ranges are automatically adjusted. Uh, I'm going to describe the details of ADR soon, but uh, let's, let me first describe the high-level uh, overview of our training procedure. So box A shows our simulator in which we randomize both appearance as well as physical parameters. And we use it to train two neural networks. Uh, there is control policy in box B, it gets as observations the fingertip positions and the cube state. And here by state, I, I mean the cube uh, position, orientation, and the face angles, and outputs some actions. And we also separately train a vision network denoted in box C. And this network, given uh, images from three simulated cameras, predicts uh, the state of the cube. Uh, then, for transferring to the real world, uh, we fit the policy with fingertip positions, which we get from the tracking system I mentioned. And we combine it with the uh, cube pose, which comes from the vision network, and also the face angles. Uh, so the face angles can also come from the vision network, but we discovered that it was pretty hard to predict them accurately. So we also developed a version of the Rubik's Cube with uh, built-in sensors and a Bluetooth, Bluetooth module. And this allowed us to remotely sense the cube angles. And we used it in some of the experiments to evaluate policies without compounding errors coming from inaccurate uh, vision prediction. OK, let's go back to ADR. The main idea is, is very simple. We start with a single non-randomized environment, and we gradually expand randomizations whenever the policy achieves good performance on the current distribution. Uh, so here you can see the distribution of cube sizes in one of our experiments. Uh, at the beginning of training, we have a single value, 5.7 centimeter, which is roughly the size of, of a real Rubik's Cube. And uh, after two weeks of training, cube sizes are sampled from between 5.5 uh, centimeter and 6.1. Uh, I'm going now to describe this, this idea a bit more precisely. So we encode environment parameters as fixed size vectors lambda. And in normal domain randomization, those lambdas would be just sampled from some fixed distribution uh, P. But in ADR, we use a parametric distribution here. So we could use any parametric distribution P phi, but we discovered that a fully factorized uh, uniform distribution works well enough so each lambda i is just going to be sampled uniformly between some phi i low and phi i high. And the only question is how to adjust the values of phi automatically. Uh, the algorithm we use is, is, is very simple, so it works as follows. At each iteration, we choose one of the boundaries. So by this, I mean we choose one of the dimensions of lambda and its lower or upper bound. So in the case of two dimensions, we have uh, for boundaries, they are just the edges of the sampling rectangle. The probability of sampling each of them is 
So let's say that we've sampled the lower bound of lambda 2. Then we sample a random point on the boundary and evaluate the model performance on it. So in the case of RL, this means running uh, the policy for one episode. In the case of vision task, it means rendering one image and checking the prediction error of the network. And then we, we append the performance on this point to a buffer associated with the given boundary. So for each boundary, there is a performance buffer. And once we have enough performance data, we just look at average performance. If it's higher than some threshold, we push the boundary uh, outwards. If it's lower than some threshold, we just pull it back. So basically, that's, uh, that's the whole algorithm. Uh, I will now briefly describe the randomizations we used in the paper. Uh, so here you can see images from our randomized simulator. It's rendered in Unity 3D games engine. We randomize things like colors, lightning, camera position, material properties, and also add some distortion operations. And the properties of all these randomizations are controlled with ADR. So for example, one dimension of lambda controls the saturation of all colors, and another one controls the magnitude of a Gaussian noise, which is added to the image. And the vision model is trained with supervised learning using these simulated images. So we don't use any real images for training. We also randomize many of the physical parameters of the system. So things like armature damping and friction coefficients, actuator force ranges and gains, or even the direction and magnitude of the gravity vector. In fact, I think we randomized all available parameters in the, in the uh, physics simulator, and it's very easy because we don't have to specify all those ranges. ADR uh, takes care of that. So the ranges of all these randomizations are controlled uh, with ADR. Uh, we've also added a few custom randomizations. Uh, so we added a randomized action latency and noise, some time step variance, and we also have correlated and uncorrelated noise in observations. Uh, but even if you randomize all existing parameters, uh, the policies can still fail to transfer to the real world because there are many effects which are not modeled in simulation at all. For example, real shadow hand has fingertips covered in rubber, which is non-rigid, and the version of the physics simulator which, was, which we used back then, it didn't support non-rigid bodies at all. So in order to deal with this fact that there are some unmodeled effects, we use an, an approach similar to adversarial RL. In particular, we have two types of adversaries. So on the left, you can see action uh, perturbation adversary. So this means that there is some adversarial network which gets the same observations as the policy and outputs some action A adversary. And then uh, the action which is uh, applied in the environment is a convex combination of the adversarial action and normal action with some mixing coefficient alpha. And the adversary is trained the same way as the policy, but with negated rewards. So it's a zero-sum game, and the adversary just tries to make the policy fail. And on the video, the red semi-transparent hand shows what would be the next state if uh, the action proposed by the adversary was taken. Uh, as you can see, uh, it usually tries to move the thumb away from the cube. And the reason for that is that it increases the chance that the cube is going to, to fall on the side. Uh, we also have tor force and torque perturbation adversary. So this is a, an adversarial network which, given the current state, uh, outputs some additional forces and torques, which are applied to all the bodies uh, in the simulator. And uh, the, the pink arrows you can see around the cube, they show the additional forces which are applied to different uh, cube slides. Uh, and uh, the maximum acceleration this uh, adversary can exert, as well as the mixing coefficient alpha for the action perturbation adversary, they are both controlled by uh, ADR. Uh, I've said that we, that we that we choose these perturbations adversarially, but as a baseline, we've also tried random perturbations. 
In particular, we tried either completely random perturbations or using a random network. Uh, by random network, I mean that we have a net neural network with completely random weights. We sample it once per episode, and this network outputs perturbations. And surprisingly, it turns out that uh, policy trained with random network adversaries perform best on the real robot. The reason for that is that random network exposes the policy to much wider set of physical conditions than one adversarial network. And also in contrast to completely random perturbations, this network applies perturbations consistently. Uh, and this allows the policy to develop implicit system identification, a skill which uh, facilitates transfer. So at least in this case, the diversity and consistency of perturbations is more important than exposing the policy to the worst possible scenario. Uh, I will now describe how we train the policy and the vision network. Uh, so let's start with policy training. So the sequence of phase rotations to be performed to solve Rubik's Cube, it comes from a scripted Rubik's Cube solver, so it is not learned. And uh, we use RL to learn a policy which can do things like rotate, red face, counterclockwise. We've trained the policy like that and deployed it on the robot and discovered that top face rotations transfer much better because they don't depend on the interactions with the PAM, which are poorly modeled. Uh, because of that, we've decided to only rotate the top face, so we train a policy which can perform two types of goal. Either rotate the top face clockwise or counterclockwise, or uh, align the cube and reorient the whole cube so that the given face is on top. And then we train on just random sequences of goals like that, and only during deployment on a physical robot use scripted Rubik's Cube solver. Uh, Let's now look at the rewards and, and actions uh, which we use for training. Uh, so the reward functions, it's, it's sh slightly shaped. Uh, so here, uh, dt denotes the distance between the current cube state and the desired cube state at time t, and the reward is uh, the difference of this term before and after the transition. So this means that if the distance is decreasing, the policy is rewarded. And we also have additional reward of five for achieving the current goal and the penalty of 20 for dropping the cube. Uh, regarding actions, they, are 20, uh, they have 20 dimensions, and they specify the desired joint angles, so things uh, uh, relative to the current ones. So things like, please rotate this joint by five degrees. So the RL policy runs at 12 hertz, and there is also a high-frequency PID controller running at one kilohertz, which then tries to achieve those angles. Uh, the reason for using the relative angles is just we really couldn't reliably measure absolute uh, angles on, on the physical hand. Also, what is a bit unusual, we discretize the action space. So, it, in reality, the actions are, are continuous, these are angles, but uh, we decided to discretize each action coordinate into 11 bins, and then the policy outputs a categorical distribution over these bins. And uh, we have found that in many robotics tasks and for many RL algorithms, this actually performs better than the standard solution of using a Gaussian distribution and continuous actions. Uh, let's take a look at observations. So the policy gets as input uh, fingertip positions, uh, current cube state and the desired cube state, and all of its observations contain some amount of noise with the magnitude of this noise being controlled by ADR. Uh, we train this policy with an algorithm called Proximal Policy Optimization, or PPO. And this algorithm, apart from the policy, it requires training of a separate value network. And this is a neural network which, given the current state of the system, predicts how much reward the policy is going to get. Uh, this, this network is only used during training. And we can exploit the fact that training happens in simulation. And we can feed it data which are not available on the physical robot. Uh, 
In particular, we give it access to noise-free versions of policy inputs, and we also give it access to the full simulator state. So this contains things like velocity of the object, uh, internal state of the cube, or hand joint angles and velocities. Uh, here you can see our neural network architecture. Uh, most of it is pretty standard. It's one fully connected layer with ReLUs followed by an LSTM. Uh, but an interesting part here is the way we handle inputs. So we call it uh, embed and add approach. And this means that uh, each, uh, each type of inf inputs, for example, object position, it's first normalized to have min zero standard deviation one. Uh, it's embedded into some space, and then we just sum the embeddings of different input types. And the reason for using this architecture is that it makes it easy to add new types of, of observation to an already trained policy. Uh, as I've mentioned, we trained the policy with uh, proximal policy optimization. So we actually used a distributed implementation of PPO, which was uh, developed for the Dota project. Uh, the policies optimi policy optimizer uses eight nodes, each with eight Volta GPUs, and they synchronize gradients with MPI. And we also have 30,000 CPU cores which run the simulator and generate training data. Uh, each of those simulators runs roughly in real time, so the setup corresponds to having 30,000 physical robots and allows us to generate about eight hours of simulated experience every second. Uh, training is uh, asynchronous, so in, at each e in each epoch, at the beginning, the policy optimizer publishes the newest policy parameters. We generate experience, and once we've got enough experience, we perform, the optimizer performs mini-batch uh, policy optimization. Uh, in fact, we have two types of workers, so they are normal wor rollout workers, we just sample from the distribution prescribed by ADR, and there are also ADR uh, evaluation workers which sample the boundary values and are used to update the ADR parameters, the parameters of the distribution of environments. Uh, but we use distribution from both types of workers for policy optimization so that nothing is, is wasted. Uh, we've noticed that uh, when using ADR, the policy basically never con converges. The volume of training environments keeps increasing, and that's why we have very rarely trained from scratch. We were usually just uh, continuing training from the best policy we had. Uh, our final policy which we use has been trained for a period of m multiple months, and in the meantime, we have changed things like uh, details of the environment, hyperparameters, or even network architecture. So that's uh, a very different approach than, than always uh, training from scratch. Uh, regarding uh, changing the policy architecture, uh, when we wanted to change it, we really couldn't afford to train from scratch because this would mean uh, losing months of training. So whenever we wanted to train a neural network with a different architecture, we were using a form of policy cloning to, to speed it up. So what we did is we were also loading into memory uh, a, an expert policy, that is a policy with good performance but different architecture, and there was an additional uh, loss which was encouraging the new policy to have the same distribution of actions as the old policy, and the same for the value function. And this loss was just summed with the RL loss. Uh, the final policy we've trained has consumed, this way has consumed uh, about 13,000 years of simulated experience. Uh, here you can see the architecture of our vision model. So this model outputs the position, orientation, and the face uh, angles. Uh, as you can see on the left, we modified central stickers in the cube so that it's possible to uniquely determine the face angles by looking at it. But uh, even after this modification, it was often impossible to determine the angle uniquely due to occlusion, so we predict the angles only modulo uh, 90 degrees. Uh, regarding the network architecture, uh, this is a pretty uh, standard uh, multi-camera ResNet. Uh, 
It consists of three ResNet stacks. Each of them gets an image from a different camera, and they have shared weights, and then we just concatenate their outputs, and there is a multi-layer perceptron uh, following. Uh, we train it uh, only using simulated data, so we basically have infinite amount of training data. We didn't have, uh, because of that, we didn't have to worry too much about overfitting, so we picked a fairly standard model, and most of the time was spent ensuring that the environment is set up properly. Uh, uh, this is also, the division model is also trained with ADR. We have an uh, optimizer node with eight uh, Volta GPUs and we use 16 nodes, one, uh, each with one uh, GPU for uh, rendering. Uh, actually, using GPUs efficiently for rendering with Unity 3D was uh, surprisingly hard, uh, and that's why we open-sourced our remote rendering solution. It's called ORB, which stands for OpenAI Remote Rendering uh, Backend. Uh, okay, let's look at the results. Uh, so here is an example of our system uh, solving Rubik's Cube on a physical robot. Uh, this policy was trained entirely in simulation. It is the first time it is experiencing real physics, but despite that, it performs pretty well. Uh, this is also a real-time video. It, uh, it has not been accelerated. In this video, we use a Bluetooth cube, which can, uh, allows us to remotely sense the uh, face angles while the cube position and orientation is estimated by the vision network. This policy can perform on average 27 operations before it gets stuck or drops the cube. Uh, here by operation, I mean I either uh, reorienting the whole cube or rotating the top face. Uh, it's natural to ask what's, what's the uh, chance of solving Rubik's Cube. Uh, this depends on what's the initial distribution of states. So if we say that initial states are 15 phase rotations away from the solved cube, then this policy succeeds 60% uh, of time on the robot. Uh, successful attempts take a few minutes, so unfortunately this is not really speed cubing. I think human record for one hand Rubik's Cube solving is around six seconds. Uh, and if we use a vision network to also estimate the phase angles, the success rate drops from 60% to 20%. Uh, from interesting behaviors, uh, you can see the policy uses uh, the pinky a lot. Actually, it uses mostly pinky and the index finger for face rotations. And the reason for using pinky is that on shadow hand, pinky has an additional degree of freedom compared to uh, other fingers. Uh, also, the policy sometimes gets stuck, uh, but it's usually able to recover. It also sometimes accidentally rotates uh, a wrong face, but again, it's usually able to recover without the need for setting new uh, high-level goal. Uh, in order to check how robust this policy is, we, uh, we applied a bunch of perturbations to our environment. Uh, in particular, we, we put a rubber glove, uh, tied two of the fingers, occluded the scene with a blanket, or pot the cube with a plush uh, giraffe or a pen. Uh, we didn't quantify these things, but uh, the policy is able to perform multiple phase rotations uh, under all of these conditions. Uh, let's take a look at some quantitative results and see whether ADR uh, improves uh, transfer performance. Uh, for those ablations, we used the simpler task of rigid box reorientation. The reason for that is simply that getting any quantifiable performance uh, for the Rubik's Cube on a physical robot takes months of training, so that's not very practical. Uh, so this table compares performance of a number of different policies. Let's compare the one trained with manual domain randomization and the one trained with ADR. Both were trained for two weeks. And on the real robot, the one trained with manual domain randomization can perform three uh, box reorientations on average, and the one trained with ADR can perform 13 rotations on average. So, uh, as you can see, ADR improves performance. Uh, let's also compare ADR policies trained for different amount of time, from half a day to multiple months. Uh, so here, this ADR entropy column, it, it shows the entropy of the sampling distribution of lambdas. Uh, 
uh, we only have uniform distributions, so this is basically the logarithm of the volume of the space of environments on which we're training. And as you can see, the longer we train, the bigger the entropy. So uh, uh, this means that the policy masters more and more environments in simulation. And also, if we look at the transfer on the real robot, it keeps uh, increasing even after months of training. Uh, so this shows that uh, using very wide distribution of training environments is critical for transfer, uh, even if the randomizations used uh, do not match uh, the real world uh, too well. Another question we wanted to answer is whether the curriculum aspect of ADR matters. By this I mean that we start with a single non-randomized environment and gradually expand the randomizations. So in order to check that, we trained a policy with ADR, and then we took the uh, distributions of environments from different stages of training and trained policies from scratch on them. Uh, here we show uh, the sim to sim transfer. So this means it shows transfer to some holdout randomization, which wasn't used for training. And the blue curve corresponds to ADR. This greenish curve uh, corresponds to a policy trained on a fixed randomization with small entropy. So this means it's a, it's a distribution of environments coming from an early stage of ADR training. Uh, the red curve corresponds to higher entropy, that is later stage of ADR training, and so on. And as you can see, uh, ADR achieves good uh, transfer performance much faster than the other policies, which shows that this aspect of curriculum is indeed important. And moreover, there is a clear pattern. Uh, the bigger the uh, entropy of the fixed distribution, the longer it takes to train from scratch, and the more important it is to use curriculum. Uh, this uh, concludes the first part of this talk, and now my colleague Carol is going to take over. All right. uh, can you hear me? <laughs>